So welcome to Solar Alberta's seventh annual solar show. At this online trade show and conference, we will be learning about renewable energy, energy efficiency, climate change, and much more. We're delighted that so many of you could join us. For those of you encountering any accessibility issues, you are encouraged to check out the free accessibility widget that our virtual conference platform provides. If you click on the accessibility icon at the top right of your page, there are a wide range of options to adjust your experience, including changing font size and colors. My name is Heather McKenzie and I am the Executive Director of Solar Alberta. I would like to take a minute to acknowledge that while Solar Alberta serves people from all over the province, I am hosting you today from Treaty 6 territory in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Treaty 6 territory is the traditional gathering place and home of many Indigenous peoples, including Nehiawak or Cree, Soto, Dene, Papasches, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, and Métis, nations whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries. Please note that we will be recording much of this conference for future distribution. Throughout the event and after, you are encouraged to give us a shout out on social media using hashtag SolarShowAB. In this session, you will hear first from our speakers and then following that, we'll take some time for a moderated Q&A. We'll be using Zoom Q&A for questions as well as the chat box on your FeedLoop conference platform. So please prioritize using the Zoom Q&A found at the bottom of the live stream window so that we can all take advantage of the upvoting option. As we likely won't have time for all of the questions that are posed, we will be pulling primarily from the questions that are voted up and show up at the top of the list. Please take a minute to warm up your Q&A skills by writing in the Q&A box what you're looking forward to in our session today. In addition to Zoom Q&A and the chat box, our conferencing software has some additional networking features that I'd like to encourage you all to check out throughout the coming days. We have set up some groups that you can join for discussion purposes. And we also have a trade show exhibitor hall with a wide variety of wonderful exhibitors that you can go visit and drop off questions or comments for those exhibiting. And now just a little about Solar Alberta. Did you know that this is Solar Alberta's 30th year of formal operation? Solar Alberta is a not-for-profit society that is dedicated to public education about renewable energy and energy efficiency. We also serve as a hub for the solar industry here in Alberta and connect the general public to industry providers through our solar industry directory, our Alberta solar map, our regular events, and much more. On April 28th, we'll be hosting our annual general meeting, and I'd like to take this opportunity to invite you all to sign up as Solar Alberta members, attend and elect your new board. There are a few vacancies to fill on the board this year. If you're interested in chatting about these opportunities to serve on the board prior to the AGM, don't hesitate to reach out to me at executive director at solaralberta.ca. I'll connect you with the right folks to learn more about the board. In addition to the in-depth industry sessions that we're offering tomorrow and on Friday of the solar show, we are proud to run a number of engaging classes for those working in the solar industry and those transitioning into the sector throughout the year. In March and April, we are running classes on battery storage design for renewables, as well as commissioning solar PV systems. We're pleased to have launched both this solar show and our annual solar seminar series online this year and anticipate that this venue will make our programming much more accessible to folks from many walks of life. We've been delighted to see registrations come in from every corner of our province and also from all over the world. With respect to our solar series, please note that we're offering a number of free webinars on Thursdays over the lunch hour between now and September. We're currently accepting registrations for our March 18th event at which we will learn more about Alberta's big commercial solar and energy efficiency opportunities. Registration for our seminars is live on our website at solaralberta.ca. We're always interested in developing more partnerships for our events. So if you or your company want to work with us to educate the public about the benefits of renewable energy, energy efficiency and climate change, please don't hesitate to reach out. 
Also, if you'd like to support Solar Alberta through our latest 5050 fundraiser, you can click on the link in the chat box and purchase a ticket or two. This is our biggest 5050 yet, and there are only a few days left to participate. We have a large quantity of free public content and very affordable paid sessions at this year's solar show, thanks to the generous support of our members, volunteers, and financial supporters. In particular, we are pleased and grateful to have the City of Edmonton's Change for Climate as the premium sponsor throughout this event. And now time for some introductions. Just going to get the bios out for, for that. I'm going to stop my screen share and you'll be able to see our beautiful presenters. All right. So our fireside chat this evening features our three keynote speakers who are all going to be offering uh, lengthy keynote addresses on Saturday for us. So uh, this is sort of a teaser night to get everybody excited and interested to uh, sit down with us for the full day on Saturday. And so I appreciate all of our keynote uh, speakers joining us for this, uh, this evening event to kick off the solar show. First up, we have Chris Nelder. Chris is the creator and host of the Energy Transition Show podcast. Chris has written about energy and investing for more than a decade. He is the author of two books on energy and investing, as well as more than 200 articles on energy in publications such as Nature, Scientific American, Slate, The Atlantic, Quartz, Financial Times, Green Tech Media, Smart Planet, and The Economist Intelligence Unit. He is also a manager in the mobility practice at the Rocky Mountain Institute in Boulder, Colorado, where he heads the EV grid integration team. He enjoys bantering with other energy geeks on Twitter and his Twitter handle is at Chris Nelder. So look him up there. <laughs> Welcome, Chris. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. We also have with us this evening, George Karunis, and he is newly minted explorer in residence with the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. His efforts to document nature's most extreme conditions have taken him all over the globe into places most people would flee from. Whether he is following a tornado outbreak across Kansas, a monster hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico, or forest fires in Australia, Karunis is always in the middle of the action with his camera rolling. Most recently, he carried the Royal Canadian Geographical Society's flag into the active Marum volcano crater on Ambrim Island, Vanuatu, home to one of the world's seven per permanent lava lakes. Karunis's explorations have often resulted in him accomplishing world's firsts. While leading a scientific expedition for National Geographic, he became the first person to set foot on the bottom of the Darvaza Flaming Gas Crater, a fiery pit that has been burning for over 45 years in the Turkmenistan desert. For this stunning feat, Karunis was named a Guinness World Record holder. His adventures have fascinated and inspired audiences worldwide, have been broadcast on the Discovery Channel, National Geographic, BBC TV, CNN, the Science Channel, and of course on his own adventure TV program, Angry Planet, which has been broadcast in over 100 countries. Karunis started chasing storms over 20 years ago and has expanded his explorations to include all types of extreme natural phenomena ever since. Today, Karunis provides geographical education and outreach across Canada. He is also a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society in the UK, chair of the Explorers Club Canadian chapter and a member of the Society of Environmental Journalists. Karunis has given four TEDx talks addressed the UN Environmental Emergency Forum, and won the Stefansson Medal for his outstanding contributions to science and to public education. Recently, he was named one of Canada's greatest explorers by Canadian Geographic magazine. Welcome, George, and thank you so much for joining us today as well. Oh, thank you so much. And last but not least, we have Dr. Sarah Hastings-Simons with us this evening. Sarah, Sarah is a senior researcher at the Payne Institute for Public Policy at the Colorado School of Mines and a research fellow for the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary. She is a macro energy system researcher and an expert in energy innovation and climate policy. Her research is focused on understanding how energy 
and industrial transitions happen within different sectors of the economy and how policy responses can improve outcomes. Sarah is co-founder and co-host of Energy Versus Climate, a live interactive webinar and podcast that explores the trade-offs and hard truths of the energy transition in Alberta, Canada, and beyond. A podcast which will be live at the Solar Show on Friday morning. She is also an expert member of the Panel for Clean Growth with the Canadian Climate Choices Institute and a member of the Board of Directors for Emissions Reduction Alberta. She was previously the Director of Clean Economy at the Pembina Institute, where she founded Business Renewable Centre Canada. Prior to her work at Pembina, she was the Practice Manager for Clean Technologies at McKinsey & Company, where she worked as a management consultant on topics of clean tech energy and sustainability. Earlier in her career, she worked as an experimental physicist on realizations of rare earth ion-based ion quantum memories. And she holds a PhD in physics from the University of Geneva. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you all for joining us today. Thanks. And I like saying that last line as if I have any idea what that means. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad that you know what Earth ion based quantum memories are. <laughs> so it's great to have you all here today. We're going to start things off with um, a few questions that I'm going to ask you folks, and uh, we'll go around and, and have each of you answer. And hopefully that will whet our public's appetite to ask some questions of their own for the second half of our, our show. And so just to kick things off, I wanted to pose the question to you that, uh, so what first sparked your interest in addressing issues related to climate change and the energy transition? It's kind of like a storytelling hour here. Anyone wanna kick us off with their, uh, their first interest, <laughs> their first love? <laughs> well, since you said storytelling hour, I'll jump in because I actually brought my story. Uh, so this is a book that, uh, I you know, I don't have clear memories of reading it as a kid, but it was uh, a book that we had as a kid. It's called um, What Makes Everything Go, an Energy Primer. Um, and it's all about, uh, well, exactly that. So how we use energy. Um, I was looking to see if it actually had solar PV. It doesn't, although it did talk a lot about this concept that all of our energy comes from the sun. Um, and the idea that, you know, whatever to energy source we're talking about, whether it's uh, fossil fuels or wind, um, it's all uh, really different forms of energy that come from the sun. Uh, so for me, I guess it's been a, a lifelong interest in energy systems. Um, maybe I can blame my parents for, for that book or something like that. Um, and I've been really, I think, lucky to have a chance to explore energy systems from a lot of different sides. So, you know, from the scientific side, um, from the business side and, and, you know, now from the policy side as well too. Uh, and so that's kind of the energy piece has been a common theme without uh, throughout that period. Awesome. Awesome. Not, I don't think many of us can say we've been interested in energy since we were young. So that's probably how you ended up getting your PhD, <laughs> the youthful interest. So George, how about you? What sparked your interest in this area? You know, it's funny because I, I think maybe we all are interested in energy as a kid, but we don't realize it. Like for me, it was uh, an interest in in science, particularly the weather. And as Sarah pointed out, of course, the sun drives almost everything on Earth, including the wind, etc. And and for me, as someone who travels the world documenting extreme forces of nature, like tornadoes and hurricanes, the sun is is the driving force behind all of that. So I didn't come into this field in a direct manner it was definitely uh, in retrospect i can sort of see the path that that brought me here but at the time it was uh, more of a passion and an interest for weather and the the other the forces that are both creative forces and destructive forces here on planet earth and and much of that is driven by the sun and it has taken me into this this place where i have sort of become a bit of a like a war correspondent on the front lines of climate change, where I'm there documenting these big events as they're happening. And that uh, has just perpetuated that, uh, that passion that started when I was much younger. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. How about for you, Chris? What sparked your interest in this field? It's too far back to remember, to be honest. I mean, um, I was just reflecting on 
a time I remember when I was about maybe seven or eight years old when I was looking at, uh, now this is in the 1970s, remind, mind you, I'm, I'm an old fart. Um, but uh, I remember seeing just exhaust belching out of the cars in front of us and asking my mother, like, where does that go? You know, uh, what is the effect of that? Um, and being concerned about sustainability issues that far back. Um, it's just always been an interest. I started a, an online magazine um, and website in 1994 when most people did not know what the internet was uh, called Better World. Uh, and its purpose was to talk about environmental and social responsibility, which was, you know, kind of an advanced uh, topic at the time. Uh, I remember covering uh, a book by uh, Paul Hawken called Natural Capitalism um, back then um, and the ecology of commerce. Uh, so, yeah, this is going back a ways. Back then it was about sustainability, uh, but I remember writing about energy issues in that magazine, uh, looking at like things like alternative fuels and so on. And the, the, the point of it then was not climate change. It was more about just sort of the environmental impact and the social um, damage caused by fossil fuels uh, that we were trying to address. Um, and then, you know, just through sustained effort into that sector, it gradually morphed into an energy focus for me. Um, I remember first writing about uh, energy transition, that quote unquote energy transition, like probably a decade ago. So hmm. yeah, it's it's been just kind of a one continuous um, exploration, I guess, for me. Yeah, I think it's neat for, for those of us who are newer to the sector and the space to hear those stories from folks like you who have been in this world for so long, you know, it's not new to you. Um, and I know Solar Alberta has been around for, for decades as well. Uh, and yet uh, the 600 or so people participating in the solar show, probably a good chunk of us are relatively new to this sector. So we really appreciate hearing stories from you folks who have been around for much longer and, uh, and have so much to share. So I guess I'll move on to a second question here. And, and this is really getting at... Um, some of the the concerns you have with uh, with the sector and the world in general. So, what do you see as the biggest challenge or barrier for our society to overcome in addressing climate change and or in transitioning to renewables? And I understand that Chris is in the U.S., so of course your society is going to be a bit different than ours. And George out in eastern Canada, yours will be a little different than the context here. But uh, North America in general, I'm thinking about, and um, you know the barriers here. Uh, for our culture and uh, and way of life, in terms of uh, really getting to the bottom of this issue, does one of you fellows want to kick us off on this one? Since Sarah jumped in on the first one, <laughs> sure, I'll jump in. Um, I mean, that's a really really big question. We all have a tremendous thirst for energy, and and right now we're in that period where we understand that. Fossil fuel days are numbered uh, in one way or another, and the future is going to absolutely going to be more sustainable methods of energy. It's just getting over that hump. But the way it relates to climate change is very complicated because even if we were to stop all fossil fuel emissions today, because of the delay effect of these greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere, we're still going to experience warming for some time. It, it's, it's like trying to steer a big ship it's not something that happens, it doesn't turn on a dime. And so there are a lot of, um, I, won't, I won't use the term uh, skeptic because skeptic is, implies something different. There are, there are people who will um, criticize clean energy saying, well, this is, having, is not having an effect because they don't realize that this, this delay is, uh, is in place. So that's a big challenge, plus, the idea of trying to remove the existing carbon that's in the atmosphere is another step that I don't think is really being taken as um, in the front lines as, as, as reducing carbon emissions. We need to actually remove a lot of that carbon that's already in the atmosphere through sequestration techniques and changes in farming and things like that, which is, that's a topic for another day. But uh, it's really a two-part issue, reducing the amount that's going out and capturing what's already there and having the patience and foresight to wait for it all to take effect. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And then there's, I guess, that adaptation piece as well, when you know that some of it's coming, no matter whether we like it or not. Right. So that's an interesting point is, uh, is we're kind of in the midst of the change. Uh, we're just trying to lessen the, lessen the damage. Right. So Sarah, how about for you? What do you see as the biggest barrier or challenge that, uh, that we have to face? Yeah, it's a very, I mean, as you say, it's a, it's a complex system. I think a lot about um, the ways that, you know, as our, our societies um, interact with the technologies that we have, right? And I think I myself coming from this very technical background was sort of, I remember shocked when I left the lab and realized that there was like a whole world out there that operated in a, in a different way with almost like a different set of rules. Um, and so I think that is really, you know, a big part of what we're facing when we're talking about uh, an energy transition, you know, that means really changing, um, you know, who is controlling our energy, uh, changing the, you know, the winners and losers, if you want. Um, and I think that that's a really significant barrier, both in terms of um, one, just kind of there's, there's always inertia in a system. Um, and so to keep doing things the way that we've been doing them is, you know, what happens unless there's some strong reason to change. Um, and then there's people that, that stand to lose from that change as well, too. And so how do you um, create enough of an understanding that, you know, we can do things differently and, and then overcome those that might be resisting it. Um, I think, you know, I also think a lot about being in Alberta um, and working in this space, which is, you know, at times frustrating, but I, but I think on the whole is really quite a quite an opportunity to see, um, you know, I think one of the things that can be really challenging too, when we talk about making big changes is that it can feel to people like, you know, a rejection of what came before. If we say now, okay, we, you know, we need to change, uh, we need to be using less fossil fuels or, or be doing things differently. Um, there is a certain, you know, interpretation of that from someone that works in that sector of saying, well, you know, if, if that's, if it's not good to be doing this, then what I was doing before, you know, you're saying that I'm bad or I'm doing bad things. And, and a lot of the discussion, um, and I think the way that people um, experience this, this discussion is in that frame. Um, and that becomes a real barrier to change as well, too. So I think we really have to find ways um, to, you know, acknowledge what, you know, within the province of Alberta, acknowledge where resources have brought us today for, you know, all the challenges that they have as well, too. Um, but, but really think about how to manage that, um, that change in a, in a way that's sensitive to, you know, people that are, that are working in that space. Mm -hmm. The worker angle and, and uh, taking that into consideration. I appreciate that for sure. How about for you, Chris, what do you see as a big barrier for, for uh, overcoming <laughs> climate change, really? Uh, well, I'll just put a finer point on uh, on what Sarah just said, I think. Um, uh, in my view, it's really just politics at this point. Um, the people who stand to lose from the energy transition have trillions of dollars on the line, and they are going to lose. Um, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. Um, you know, when I was first, like, I was in the solar business 15 years ago. Um, and at that time, we needed subsidies to uh, sort of put solar on a level playing field and make it competitive with other, you know, grid power options. Um, that's no longer the case. Wind and solar are now the cheapest way of producing a new kilowatt hour of power in over two thirds of the world. Um, you know, it used to be the case that uh, we didn't, we weren't really sure we could run a grid with high percentages of uh, renewables on it. You know, we had a lot of people, mainly lobbyists and propagandists from the fossil fuel industry, telling everybody that the grid was going to fall over and we would face blackouts if we got high percentages of intermittent renewables on the grid. Uh, that turned out to be false. Uh, Germany has now the most reliable grid in Europe with one of the highest percentages of uh, renewables on its system. Um, we weren't really sure that we would be able to, you know, maintain grid balancing uh, easily with high per percentages of variable renewables on the grid. Um, California, Germany, and many other places have proven that, that, that that's not an issue. Um, so the economics work, the technology works, the grid balancing works, the context works, you can do supply chains, you can build this stuff at scale. None of those things are important hurdles anymore. The only thing that's really still a hurdle is politics. Mm -hmm. uh, fighting the uh, very determined resistance of people with a lot of money on the line who stand to lose from the energy transition 
and who are willing to uh, do what they can to stop the energy transition for their own selfish benefit, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of the rest of us wanting to take action on climate change. They, they don't care about that. They care about their money. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the problem. Yeah, we certainly saw a lot of money being spent on trolling our show the last few weeks. I don't know if you've seen any of our ads, but uh, there's certainly a good good amount of time and energy having to be spent on just managing the hate and vitriol uh, that people are being paid to uh, to spout on our walls. And so we, we know that that's a minority because of the number of people who are registering for our show. We know that that is not um, mainstream anymore, but I think what you say about there are people in positions of power who are who are uncomfortable and scared and and putting a lot of energy and resources into to fighting the transition. It's it's very true, and we're seeing it uh, even at this solar show. So I appreciate you commenting on that. Um, that's that's weird. I've never run into that kind of resistance. That's odd. Oh, it's it's toxic, toxic. Don't don't go look at the comments. <laughs> Oh, right. Sorry, you're joking. <laughs> sarcastic, oh, yeah, you got me. You got me. Well, I I had for a moment thought, oh, yeah, I guess things are better in the States, right? You know, <laughs> no, you got to remember that I for, for many years, I wrote columns when the comments were open. Okay. Uh, and I had lots and lots of paid propagandists from the fossil fuel industry who would literally chase me around on the web. I would write for multiple publications that had no connection to each other and the same people would chase me down and oh. drop nasty comments into every oh. single thing that I wrote. And, yet uh, and they, they put a lot of time and energy into that. They were clearly not doing it on their spare time. No, I hear you. I hear you. But also the power shift, uh, you know, that you were speaking to, I think we see that I've been reading a lot about what's happening in the US, the democratization of sort of the energy sector, uh, you know, more and more people being able to generate solar uh, from a community generation perspective. And, you know, community generation hasn't really taken off so much here in Alberta or Canada yet. We're kind of trying to get it going. Um, but it is interesting to see that there are places in the U.S. where it's very uh, real, this transition you're, you speak of, where, you know, they're it, taking literal power from the, the hands of a few and a monopoly and distributing it throughout the population. And so, you know, this is a, a major shift. It's not something uh, that people are taking lightly. I appreciate that you're speaking to that. Number three, my big question here, and, uh, and I'll, I'll pose it to you, uh, all three of you again, is what gives you hope? And we've talked about the barriers, the challenges, and I think a lot of us can feel like those are overwhelming at times. So I'm just curious, uh, you keep coming back to this sector, all three of you, you keep coming back to this work, and you're going ahead and forging, forging ahead. So I know there's something there that's hopeful for you. Um, you know, as you're raising awareness about climate change, renewable energy, uh, doing that meaningful work, uh, where are you getting that inspiration from? And I think, uh, I think Sarah kicked us off on the first one and George on the second. So Chris, why don't you kick us off on this third question about hope? <laughs> I mean, why not? Uh, things are better now than they've ever been in my 30 some odd years of working on this stuff, right? We're, we're winning. We're finally <laughs> winning. Uh, what's not to be happy about? What's not to be optimistic about? I mean, yes, we have a hell of a mountain still to climb to take action on climate change and, uh, and so on, but things have never been better. Uh, you know, we have, uh, especially in the U.S. government now under the Biden administration, we have an incredibly talented group of people who are intensely dedicated to energy transition who have been working on this stuff for decades. That's never been the case in any previous U.S. administration. Um, you know, as I said before, wind and solar are just winning on straight cost now, unsubsidized in, in most of the world. Um, and, you know, I got to say, uh, from my perch as the host of the Energy Transition Show, um, I regularly get just the most incredible email from our listeners uh, that just, you know, reinforces that... Um, the work we're doing uh, matters to them, that it's helping them to overcome their own despair, that it's giving them hope, that it's enervating them, that it's encouraging them to take action or sometimes even change their careers. You know, I, I hear from a lot of sort of mid-career professionals that are like, oh, you know, I'm 45 years old and I'm sick of being an accountant and I want to do something on climate change, you know, uh, and your show is helping me to figure out what to do. 
So that is just an incredibly uh, positive, constant reinforcement that I get from our listeners. I mean, you know, what, what's not to be happy about? Yeah, absolutely. I don't know about you, but after every one of these webinars, my LinkedIn just lights up with a whole bunch of middle-aged people who are like, I want to retrain in renewables. And how do I do that? And and I can, you know, send them to all the different courses and connect them with our presenters and the different institutions. And it's quite amazing. You still, usually those are conversations you have with, you know, 18 year olds, but uh, not in this sector. It's, it's everyone uh, at every age. So it's neat to hear that you're getting that feedback as well. How about for you, George, what's bringing you hope, especially as you're standing in the middle of a tornado? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh Unlike uh, Chris and, and uh, Sarah, I don't work directly in the energy sector, but I have this very unusual relationship with what you do. Um, but part of that involves a lot of talking with students. A lot of what I do is outreach, uh, getting kids interested in science and nature and the environment. And the trend that I have seen has been very encouraging. The kids that are in school right now they, they have climate change as part of their daily front of mind knowledge. And it's not something that they need to be convinced of or they need to be talked into the idea of renewables. It's just part of their vernacular. And so that really gives me a lot of hope for the next generation to come. I, I understand that uh, there's tremendous change that's happening right now, but the future, in my opinion, looks bright from where I'm uh, standing. Now, of course, I make my living documenting extreme forces of nature and climate change is exacerbating those. What I would love is for everyone to put me out of a job. Mm -hmm. And I see that, I, I hopefully see that day coming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, thank you for that. And I, I think a lot of us on the line tonight are homeschooling right now. And so, uh, you know, we're actually seeing our kids uh, talking about climate change and with their teachers and, uh, you know, engaging in these conversations. It, it is quite nice, actually. I've been enjoying watching them do that. And I, I think to myself, oh, and I never had teachers who brought that up when I was little. And, and maybe I, we'd be a lot better off if, <laughs> if I had. So it is, it's nice to see. And, uh, and thanks for speaking to that. The, uh, the experience that so many of our ha us are having during COVID is learning what our kids are learning. So I <laughs> appreciate you touching on that. Sarah, how about you? I think you're home with kids right now too, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> I am, yeah. I'm learning that I really need to brush up on my like uh, grammar and parts of speech. I definitely don't remember that from school. So, um, but I'm, um, I, I like what you said, George, about, you know, wanting to be put out of a job. I think I often feel like that too. You know, I would be very happy if I get to, you know, retirement time or even before slightly. And it's kind of like, okay, that, you know, that things have changed and there's no more questions or no more things to work on here. That would be good. In fact, my son actually said to me the other day, I'm glad that you're working on, on climate change, mommy, because then like you'll fix this problem. And so we can fix like the next one that comes along. So um, I guess that's that's a goal to have uh, for the future. Um, but I think a lot like what, what Chris said, I mean, it feels, it does feel like things are different now in a way um, that is sort of almost unbelievable. Like I almost sort of, you know, pinch myself like, is this, you know, really happening? Or, or today there was another series of um, announcements made around uh, a new folks appointed to the Biden White House. And, and as Chris was saying, you know, these are people that have been working on this topic and have, you know, been coming up with plans for how to deal with it for, for decades plus, and now they're in a position to really do it. And so it does feel very, um, very much like, you know, unlike ever before, uh, th things are starting to change. Um, and it also, you know, coming back actually to that conversation we were having earlier around, uh, you know, who, who has power and who has money to influence, I think we are also seeing some of those um, coalitions start to shift, right? And, and so, you know, a big one, I think that has just been happening in the last, I don't know, weeks, months uh, in, a, in a major way um, is related to the announcement from a number of uh, auto manufacturers that they're going to, um, you know, be moving really solidly to electric vehicles. And 
that's obviously important um, because you know we know that emissions from from vehicles is a is a major source of um, of carbon emissions. Um, but it's also important because you know historically the the auto manufacturers and the oil and gas industry have been very closely linked in um, you know what they want to see, which is more consumption of of oil and gas. Uh, and so you know a shift uh, there and sort of a, a maybe closer alignment um, for the, the manufacturers, the auto manufacturers with other, other groups in society, I think has the potential to uh, move things quite quite quickly, um, along with you know, some of the other, uh, other um, folks like FedEx and others starting to look at electric bikes for delivery and, and really kind of just so many, on any topic, you can point to so much stuff that really seems to have real kind of money and uh, intention behind making that change. Yeah, it's palpable, isn't it? Really, like I just joined Solar Alberta in September, and I can't tell you how the transition from, you know, every day hearing about job losses in Alberta, the economy being depressed, the pandemic, and then joining Solar Alberta, it was just like a ray of sunshine. I mean, you know, every day I'm hearing from people who are hiring and people who have new things coming on the grid. And, you know, we're profiling uh, projects where it's just unprecedented growth. And it's, it's amazing to be in that space right now when everything else around us is so depressing. So I definitely feel the energy that you that you folks are talking about and um, and appreciate that. So I wanted to uh, before we go into the questions from the audience, uh, and I will remind folks to make sure you're you're using your Q and A. So we have a, a plethora to to choose from. Um, but I was wondering if you could each give us a little teaser about your presentation on Saturday. Obviously, don't give away too much, but because uh, we still want everybody to show up on Saturday for the full meal deal. Um, but it would be nice for everybody just to get a little bit of an impression of, of what you have in store and what you want to talk about more on Saturday. Um, so, uh, Sarah, do you want to just uh, kick us off with an introduction? Uh, um, Sarah Hastings hey, hey, Simon presentation 101 <laughs> Cole's notes <laughs> sounds good yeah well I'm looking forward to to talking with everybody about it. I'm going to be looking at you know what Canada and Alberta is doing around climate um, where their gaps and in particular kind of going through a little bit of the you know what's hot in uh, in energy and climate trends uh, so you know hydrogen and electric vehicles and carbon capture and storage you know what's that we, we hear a lot about all these things um, and there's a lot of excitement around them a lot of great things are happening and in some cases there are things that are you know overstated a little so I'm going to be doing a little bit of a deep dive into what's uh, what's real and what's hype and trying to separate the two. Great thank you. How about you George? Where are you headed on Saturday? We're going to be heading all over the world on Saturday. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be bringing the audience along as a as a expedition partner as I take you through some of my most extreme expeditions involving wild weather, climate change, and other environmental aspects uh, that uh, by the end of it, I hope that you either have to pick your jaw up off the floor or you think I'm completely crazy or maybe a combination of the two, but it's, uh, I'm going to be pulling out some of the most dramatic of my uh, adventures. Sounds good. I think we'd, most of us would much rather travel with you uh, in the comfort of our own homes than uh, literally be <laughs> on the ground for most of those weather events. How about you, Chris? Where are you headed on Saturday for your presentation? I'm going to present uh, the trends of, around energy transition, um, sort of fuel by fuel, sector by sector, uh, all around the world, um, and just really try to make the case that uh, um, things are getting better um, and uh, to demonstrate some of the reasons why I'm optimistic. Nice, nice. Appreciate it. So we've got some questions coming in now in the Q&A and, and your comments earlier also sparked some additional questions in my mind as well. So I'm going to pull a few from the crowd here. Um, question from uh, the crowd. Have any of you read Bill Gates' new book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster? And if yes, what is your impression of the message? And I have to admit that I haven't read it. So if you could also maybe just <laughs> summarize the message for those of us who haven't read it, uh, that would be helpful too. Any takers on that one? <laughs> I have not read it. Okay. No, I haven't read it either. But um... I've followed his views on energy transition for uh, quite a long time. 
Um, he was uh, definitely uh, a disciple of uh, Václav Smil's, um, and I have some violent disagreements with uh, Smil. Um, he, Bill has also been a longtime investor in um, next generation nuclear technology, which I think is a dead end. So um, to be honest, I'm not terribly interested. I, I, I don't think I will read that book. <laughs> well, that's good. You're honest, and I appreciate that. How about you, Sarah? Uh, I, I also haven't read it, so I can't really comment. I guess I'll offer up a, a book suggestion if people are looking for something to read. Um, yes. There was an anthology that came out, uh, I guess, end of last year, maybe, called All We Can Save. Um, and it's a wonderful anthology of essays and uh, even poems um, by uh, particularly women working in climate uh, that kind of really tries to take a new view of how we can bring a, a feminist approach to the climate problem in a way that that hasn't really been taken so much over the past decades that people have been working on it. So um, if you're looking for, for a climate book to read, I highly recommend that one. It's called All We Can Save. Great. Right. Also maybe helpful for finding other prospective speakers for future events as well. <laughs> Thanks for that. How about you, George and Chris? Do you guys have books to recommend if if not the Bill Gates one? <laughs> oh, gosh. The, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I wish you could see this bookshelf. <laughs> <laughs> maybe too many. Too many. Yeah, there's, <laughs> we'd be here all night. Um, you know, I, I, I cover some of the books that I think are really interesting on my podcast. So every once in a while, I'll do a show just to really, you know, take a close look at a book. Uh, most recently, we did one called Making Climate Policy Work by Danny Cullenward and David Victor, um, which basically is kind of a critique of where carbon policy and carbon markets have failed um, and uh, trying to steer us toward um, more efficacious policies. Uh, on that note, I also recently did an interview with uh, Leah Stokes uh, on her book, um, Short Circuiting uh, Policy, I think it was called, uh, where, again, you know, the, the purpose of her book is to just sort of forensically examine where climate policies have, uh, have succeeded and failed in the past and to try to draw some useful lessons from that. Um, for this group, uh, I would recommend... Uh, let it shine by i think it was john perkins right is that do i have that right um it's uh i'm i can't really see it from here it's like the four thousand year history of solar power um and it's just an absolutely fascinating uh book where he looks at solar power um innovations uh in multiple cultures over thousands of years and it's uh it's really a terrific book for those who love solar interesting thank you George, how about you? Anything to add to the book mix? Yeah, actually, not a book so much, but a, a film uh, called A Global Warning by a colleague of mine, Mark Terry. And he does a lot of work with the United Nations and does a lot of uh, student outreach involving climate change uh, with them. So mm -hmm. anything by Mark Terry, I highly recommend, including that particular film. No, oh, interesting. I'm sort of feeling like Solar Alberta might need to start a book and film club so that we can uh, explore some of these books uh, and films together, uh, especially during these COVID times where it's harder for us to get together and mix and mingle. So plus, that's... plus read this one with your kids. It's oh, great. Okay. Or, or adults, yeah. you know, it's a good, it's a good primer of uh, the, I don't think it's out of print, but you can find it used online. If it creates more Sarah's in the world, I think we'll all do it. So that's great advice. Thanks. How about this question here? How important is Alberta in the energy transition from the global context and in Canada? I think some of us who are born and raised in Alberta think the world revolves around us. Um, and we're sort of told that, you know, often that if Alberta doesn't get its act together, we're all going to die. So I guess the question is, is, you know, how much truth is there to that? Are we sort of the center of the, <laughs> the energy transition universe? Or, you know, is everybody going to be fine if we just decide to sit this one out? So, I mean, I guess I, I believe that it is important, but maybe not always for the reason that people say. And I guess that's sort of the theory behind why we you know, started this podcast, even from Alberta. Um, but I think it's important less because, you know, how much oil Alberta produces is going to really impact the climate globally. I, I think that's not the main thing. I think where the province is important is that it is one of the canaries in the coal mine for you know, a transition, right? And so how well that is managed, how well uh, you know, the, the challenges and job losses and, and kind of dislocations um, can be addressed um, 
really, you know, can, can I think either serve as a, as a great example of how to do that in other places or as a bit of a warning and, you know, even more ammunition to try to prevent some of that change. And so I think for that reason, um, there is some importance to what happens here. Thank you. How about from your perspective, Chris, does Alberta ever come up in your conversations in the U.S.? Are we on the radar at all? Um, yes, but not on the solution side of the ledger. Um, <laughs> am I even allowed to talk about this? Like uh, You can feel free. We are a not-for-profit. You go for it. <laughs> both my parents are Canadian, so uh, I guess I have some legitimacy here, but... Um, you know, uh, the history of the, uh, the oil sands and it's the power that it wields in, in Alberta is uh, no friend of energy transition. I don't think anybody would dispute that. Um, it's definitely going to be a challenge to, um, to uh, wean the province, if you will, off of that power um, and, and the revenue, of course. Um, you know, as I look at Alberta from just a straight resources standpoint, I think there is a lot of potential there um, to develop uh, renewable energy and to be a part of the solution set. Um, but uh, but on balance, at least from this side of the border, Alberta looks like more part of the problem than anything. Mm -hmm helpful to know how we look from elsewhere. I think those of us who are here just see that 4,600 megawatts of solar coming online in the near future and think, uh, you know, oh, we're good to go. But that's not how the rest of the world is still is perceiving us necessarily. It's not yet mission accomplished in terms of both our, our actions as well as our image. How about for you? I mean, if, I, I mean, if we heard a fraction of uh, about your solar efforts as we hear about things like, you know, Keystone XL, <laughs> um, you know, it would be different, but that's not what we hear about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're not really promoting, promoting our, uh, our solar activity to the same degree. That's an interesting point. Uh, George, how about out east? Do you guys ever hear about our incredible solar potential in Alberta? Are we, are we talking up our 4,600 megawatts that are coming online or are we, are we still spouting off pipeline uh, to, <laughs> constantly well yeah you, you mentioned uh albertans believing that they're the center of the universe and we all know of course it's us here in toronto <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes you have the same call we actually have that in common <laughs> every time i go out west i have to apologize for being from toronto um, <laughs> but it's true that um here in the eastern part of, of of the country when we think alberta we we think of oil and we think of the oil sands and and keystone etc and we don't really get to hear so much about a lot of the solar advances that are happening so there's a lot of uh there's a lot of ground to make up in that regard absolutely yeah, we'll have to start uh, start promoting what we're doing and then doing more of it, hopefully. So I appreciate that. It's good, good food for thought to see how we're perceived. Um, I guess another question we have here, we talked a lot about how the cost of solar has come down. And I think I read that it's about 90% in the last 10 years that solar, the prices have come down. And now, as you mentioned, Chris, we are uh, without subsidies, uh, the cheapest new type of energy along with wind. Uh, on the grid today. So that's really exciting, but you still have a lot of Albertans who, at the end of the day, if they go to try and put solar on their roof, you know, they're looking at $12,000 if they have a small roof, maybe 15, 20 if they have a big roof. Um, so, and lots of usage. So I guess uh, they're still looking at a pretty sizable chunk that they have to pay up front. Um, and I know there has been some innovation around that, but we're getting a question here about, um, do you see the capital costs associated with setting up a new home solar system coming down with the direction that US and Canadian governments are heading? You know, how do you see people being able to afford solar and to participate in, in that uh, transition at the grassroots level if they don't have a good chunk of change up front? I'll, I'll tackle that to start with. Um, I, I I don't think government policy is, you know, X subsidies uh, really that relevant here. Um, 
there's there's certainly some things that we can do uh, to you know remove permitting hurdles and interconnection process hurdles and, and that kind of thing that will incrementally help bring down the cost of a solar installation. But generally, the price decline of solar has been just driven by the the learning curves of the industry itself, right? I mean, it's just manufacturers learning how to make modules more cheaply, essentially. Um, uh, the other costs associated with an installation are, are much harder to uh, reduce. And, and I don't know that we have, you know, steep uh, uh, cost reduction curves still ahead of us. I mean, we're, we're through the biggest part of that. We're starting to kind of go a little asymptotic, you know, um, in, the, uh, in the cost decline curve. Um, what's more relevant here, I think, in terms of just being able to put solar on your roof and deal with that um, initial capital cost is, is a finance problem. It's, it's not a technology problem. It's not really even a solar problem. It's mostly a finance problem. Um, and there are various uh, entities out there that will, um, you know, uh, I mean, the third party solar leasing model, you know, became very popular about 15 years ago. Uh, that still exists. The, you know, there are other comp kinds of companies that'll do that, that will just say, all right, you know, no capital up front, we'll put it on your house and you're going to pay us a monthly fee for the next 10 years or whatever it is. Um, and it'll be paid off. Uh, that, that's probably the, the key strategy, I think, in terms of making solar more affordable now, mm -hmm. especially for rooftop, you know, um, homeowners and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. But, and Sarah and George, anything to add on that one? Yeah, so just on some of the Alberta context, I think, um, you know, there's some, when you dig into the details of the regulation here, there's some of the ways that other places have been able to participate in, in solar that, um, that are harder here, right? So we don't have things like virtual net metering. Um, our, uh, our, our approach to net metering um, is further or sort of is giving lower value to the solar than what is done in um, in most other jurisdictions, at least across the US. So I think there is, you know, certainly some room to, to take a closer look at that and see, um, you know, make sure that that the uh, rates in, um, in Alberta are, are sort of more accurately reflecting the value that solar really brings. Um, and that can just kind of help um, uh, make the economics work out and, and then make that kind of uh, financing piece um, even easier as well. Yeah, and I know there are some municipalities, I think four this year coming online with SEEP programming, which is our version of the PACE programming in the US, which will additionally help some homeowners. It'll still be homeowners focused, so it doesn't get at the virtual net uh, metering uh, component really, where you could actually be a, a renter and participate in the solar transition. Um, but it does at least get at some of those folks on a fixed income, some of those folks who can't afford the upfront costs they could potentially pay through their property bills. I know Edmonton's moving on that, Canmore and a few others. So um, be neat to see how that goes. George, I have a question for you. And I think um, this one in particular, I have to ask you because you're in the midst of these disasters. And so I came to solar through a weird path. So as a humanitarian, really. So my background is in international development. I have a heart for the kids and whatnot, you know, focused mostly on AIDS orphans and whatnot. And, and so anyways, as I looked at, you know, some of the areas in the world that are hardest hit by climate change and that are suffering the most and the people like with Hurricane Katrina, the people who are suffering the most, often the most disenfranchised, the most powerless, the people who are the most vulnerable. Um, I guess I'm, I'm wondering if you could start us off and just speak to the humanitarian aspect of climate change and, and what you've seen on that topic on the ground and, and you know, the, is there that urgency that I'm sensing to address this so that we can, you know, make sure that those people who already have it hard in life don't get hit even harder? Absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up because people in the West don't fully understand or see with their own eyes how the world is changing in other parts of the world. And especially in like some of the low-lying islands in, um, in the South Pacific, low-lying countries like Bangladesh, where they're getting increases in er uh, erosion, where farmers walk down to the edge of the Indian Ocean and they literally point out to the ocean. They tell me that's where my farm used to be. Not only is there 
land not usable, their land no longer exists. And about a half a million people have to relocate from southern Bangladesh into Dhaka every year. And it's becoming one of the most densely populated places in the world, with tremendous poverty. And countries like Tuvalu and Fiji, specifically Tuvalu, when I was visiting there, speaking with some of the government officials there, they are actively planning for the future where they may have to abandon their entire nation and move their population somewhere else because their islands will become uninhabitable once their fresh water sources are inundated by seawater from sea level rise. And so climate refugees exist today and it has been going on for quite, quite some time. And uh, as you mentioned, Hurricane Katrina, I, I was in the middle of Hurricane Katrina as it was coming ashore. And uh, I will talk more about it on, on Saturday, but feeling the ferocity of that weather event, knowing that we're getting more and more and stronger hurricanes every year as the, as the ocean with that dark surface is absorbing more of that incoming solar radiation, which is something you want a solar panel to do, but you don't want the ocean to do that. Um, it, it's, it paints a bit of a, a grim picture for people who don't contribute a lot to the actual greenhouse gas emissions. People in Tuvalu contribute less than 1%, uh, you know, a fraction of 1% compared to places like North America, China, other uh, you know, parts of Europe. So it's, uh, it's, it's disturbing and unsettling uh, to go there, but I think it's important for, for the world to see these situations and what's happening because we are often disconnected from the cause and the effect. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I think you're touching on the, the fact as well that a lot of the people who are most negatively impacted are not themselves sort of consuming a lot of fossil fuels or things that uh, that are actually contributing to climate change. On that topic, I get the impression that, you know, solar is really taking off in Alberta and e electric vehicles are, I mean, I'm starting to see them everywhere. Uh, Sarah, you were mentioning the EV uh, transition here. And, and I see that it seems that Albertans are excited now because we've discovered we could maybe consume our way out of climate change. You know, if we can just buy our way out of this, which is something we're comfortable with, we're used to. I think even George Bush once said, you know, let's deal with this recession, everyone go buy stuff. And, you know, we have kind of part of that mentality here is, you know, when times are tough, we should we should hit the malls, right? And, and, and during COVID, it's fascinating. Like it's just, uh, often the malls are open before schools. I mean, it's kind of bizarre. We have this consume mentality. Um, do you have concerns? Do the three of you have concerns about that? Do you think if we just buy more EVs, more solar, more wind, we're going to be able to solve this problem? Or do we actually have to even like talk about that elephant in the room, which is reducing consumption and maybe not buying as much stuff. Uh, where do you land on that topic or that issue? So Sarah, do you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'll often I'll offer one one thing. I, I wrote a piece recently with a colleague of mine, Greer Gosnell, um, that sort of looks at this question in, in a certain way, um, really from the perspective of saying, you know, if if our goal is to improve, to continue to improve the standard of living for our populations and to reduce carbon, sort of the narrow way to look at that is, you know, how do we do all the same things that we've done with uh, with less carbon? Um, but you can broaden that out, and then I think sort of as you're suggesting, look more holistically at what is you know improving well-being um, and and how carbon intensive is is that? And so in this piece we were talking about it and highlighting in particular things like the education and care sector, um, which is, uh, you know, a sector that uh, in some sense those jobs may be inherently relatively low carbon. Um, they are, uh, and, and what we were sort of exploring in this work is the idea that that because they are female dominated, they, they may tend to be lower paid. And so, you know, the extent to which we use GDP as a measure um, and, and as the, you know, the, the measure of how well our economy is doing, um, we may not really be capturing well-being in a, in a fulsome way. And so then that starts to raise questions of, you know, how do we use 
different metrics of, um, of, of well-being other than GDP. And I mean, that's something that, you know, many are, are kind of thinking about. But I do think that that, you know, does become a part of, a, of the holistic uh, question, um, which is not to say, though, that we shouldn't, you know, at the same time move ahead um, on the things that we know make sense and that we know we need to do, right, which is to, to certainly decarbonize our electricity system, um, particularly as, as a you know, cornerstone of a electrification um, approach to reducing emissions. So it's sort of a, I guess, a yes and answer to um, to how I would approach that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thanks very much. How about for you, Chris? Where do you uh, land on the consumption <laughs> topic in general? Uh, well, first, I'm going to beg that question a little bit because um, I think that embedded in there is this idea that. Um, consumption is bad and that we should stop consuming so much um, and that uh, essentially all energy transition solutions are fundamentally flawed because they involve consumption. Um, and uh, this is obviously not the first time I've heard this argument. Um, Degrowth uh, arguments have been around for a long time. Um, I've grappled with them many times over the decades. Um, in fact, I, I did a podcast episode uh, last year about the, um, the film uh, Planet of the Humans, both uh, Michael Moore and Jeff Gibbs and Ozzy Zayner, uh, because a lot of people looked at that film as sort of uh, reinforcement of their priors that, um, uh, that consumption is bad um, and that, you know, uh, buying stuff, building wind turbines, buying EVs was no kind of solution. Um, my objection to that argument is that basically it has no policy relevance whatsoever. Um, I understand it. I agree that if we were to stop consuming things so much, it would be helpful. I agree that, you know, the rich consume more than their share of resources and all those things. I have yet to hear anybody articulate a single policy to actually change that. Mm -hmm. So I'm all about results, right? Um, I, I, I like policies that are relevant, that actually have teeth, that you can actually do something with. Um, I have yet to hear a single degrowth policy that, that actually can do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I try to just accept that the world that I'm in, uh, in as much as, you know, we all have homes that we like to keep warm in the winter and we have to go places and we, in many cases, have no choice but to drive there. Um, if that's the world that we're in, let's clean it up and green it up as much as we can. And, you know, my work at, at uh, RMI for the past five years has been about vehicle grid integration. It's been about um, essentially knocking down the barriers to EV adoption. And so, you know, I'll talk your ear off about EVs and why I think they're uh, an important part of the solution set, if, if that's what we want to talk about. Mm -hmm. But if the point is that we, you know, should just stop consuming stuff so much, I'd you know, I would say, yeah, okay, um, and then go back to my work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's important to think about uh, the realism of it, right? And and are we actually going to just stop? <laughs> uh, and, and truth be told, it's really hard for a lot of us because of the way our cities have been designed. So, you know, if we were going to reduce consumption on some of these fronts, we would have actually had to plan our cities differently a long time ago. Uh, so you can you can make some inroads, you can uh, adapt your urban planning now and, and do your infill and your transit oriented development, but there's still limitations on that. So I appreciate you speaking to that policy uh, practicality piece. Anything to add on that topic, George? If not, I've got another excellent weather question coming your way. <laughs> Uh, the only thing I would like to add to, to that is um, I, developing nations who who look to the West as uh, as a beacon or as a an example of of a standard of living that they should necessarily strive for, and it's hypocritical of us to tell other nations how they should develop, and so that's one of the challenges that we're seeing now, and we'll probably continue to see in terms of. Uh, commoditization of literally mm -hmm. everything and just as a reminder everything that we buy whether it's been a piece of aluminum that's been recycled a hundred times or or you name it every item that you touch every day at some point will end up in a landfill mm -hmm. 
We actually we, have a panel on Friday, oh. <laughs> just so you know. I have to plug it because at Friday at lunch, we're doing recycling of solar PV in Canada and Alberta. And uh, so we are hoping to divert our solar panels from, <laughs> from landfill, but I get where you're coming from. Uh, ultimately, there, there are those life cycle Im implications we need to be thinking about for all of our products. Sarah? Oh, yeah, I was just going to come back to it because I, I think I agree with what Chris is saying about, you know, it has to be actionable. And I think, you know, sort of degrowth uh, in that sense is probably, you know, it's a very hard sell to make. Um, I think there are things, though, that we can do, as, as you were saying, Heather, around, uh, you know, things like designing and, and enabling people to choose different forms of transportation. Or, you know, I do think that that some of the um, progress that's been made around, you know, the, the types of regulations that would enable a more circular economy are things that um, that we, we can actually take action on and start to point us in the right direction. But it isn't indeed, you know, just saying, oh, well, people should, you know, consume less stuff, but it's looking at where where our policies do, uh, you know, influence that or what kind of playing field do they set out? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I know I myself sometimes get excited about the idea of, of buying, you know, a new, a new this or that. And then I have that second, you know, that other part of me that says, oh, no, <laughs> you shouldn't be excited about that. And so we're all kind of walking that, uh, you know, that that line right now where we're trying to decide how excited are we about allowed to be about some of these new innovations. And and sometimes it makes sense to allow ourselves to be uh, excited. Here's a big question here. It kind of touches on uh, a variety of topics, but people like to attack renewables whenever they see a natural disaster destroy installations. Um, do you think there are a particular form of natural disasters that would most negatively affect the renewable energy industry? Uh, or I suppose that you could put that a different way that would make us the least reliable or what have you, um, or undermine our reliability? Or do you think there are technologies that will be more resilient to climate change than others? And I think this is touching on what we're seeing in Texas, right? And everyone's, there's a big blame game going on. Um, who is to blame? <laughs> We've all got friends without power, without water, and and now without masks, apparently. Uh, anyway, so sorry, I'm digressing. <laughs> I do follow a lot of politics. <laughs> but I feel that I feel like they've already got it hard enough. They don't need to uh, lose the masks. But anyways, but really, are there technologies that are more resistant to some of these extreme weather events? And uh, where would you go with that question around um, the critique? of renewables when extreme weather happens. You want to uh, kick us I, off, I, I really want to have first crack at this one, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, you're in the US, you get to, um, you get Texas dibs. <laughs> you really get me started with this one. Um, <laughs> Texas is a great example. Um, there's not a single resource type in Texas that didn't fail. Nuclear plant went down because one of its meters froze. Um, coal piles froze solid and could not be fed into the coal power plant. Uh, natural gas lines supplying natural gas fired power plants froze up and couldn't deliver the gas. Um, there was a few wind turbines that underperformed because they iced up. Um, solar obviously is a bit challenged when uh, the skies are dark and full of snow, uh, right? Um, and there really isn't like a lot of geothermal or hydro to speak of in, in, in Texas. The point being, there's no type of power generation uh, technology that's 100% reliable, full stop. Um, and that's a problem for system uh, operators to worry about. It's not a problem for policymakers to worry about. Um, you know, system balancing is done at the system level. It's not done at the generator level. Right. And so it's the system operator's job to, if you will, orchestrate all these different uh, things and, and make them operate harmoniously. Um, you know, you 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 don't expect the, the violins to play what the trombones can play and vice versa. Right. Uh, everybody's got a got a place in the choir um, or a place in the orchestra. Uh, and, and a system operator can balance all those things. I should mention that all of those energy sources operate in in other parts of the world without freezing, without failing, because they were winterized. The problem in Texas was not the resource mix. It wasn't even the resource type. It wasn't even necessarily the, the market type. 
and I've heard all the arguments. Believe me, I'm going to develop a I'm developing a podcast episode on this. I've collected 60 articles. I've been reading everything I can get my hands on. And the bottom line is, as far as I can tell, this stuff wasn't winterized. That was the main problem. Everything else was a series of cascading errors and effects that flew uh, that flowed from that problem. Um, had that not been the case, had everything been winterized, we would be having a different conversation today. And, and there still would have been generators that failed. And, and we'd probably be having a different conversation about, well, maybe they shouldn't have an energy only market or maybe they shouldn't have their own interconnection. And maybe, you know, they should have been able to import power from other states and lots of other, you know, issues like that. But um, it, resource reliability um, in, in terms of power generation um, is, is not something that any particular uh, type of resource has any corner on. Um, they all have a place um, and it's the system operator's job to make them all work together. And resiliency is about a lot more than just your generation mix. It's about winterization, it's about uh, market structure, it's about governance, uh, it's about a whole lot of other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I know uh, pretty much everything in Edmonton where I'm coming from is uh, is winterized, so we don't tend to have some of those same hiccups here, but uh, there are still, you know, uh, occasional challenges when it's minus 40 uh, degrees out, so we, you know, we do have our hiccups, but they just, they don't tend to last as long as they did in Texas, <laughs> and uh, and uh, so it's it's good to hear your take on that. George, how about for you? What do you think uh, when it comes to extreme weather and uh, climate resilient um, technologies, I guess. Where would you go with that question? Yeah, I totally agree with Chris in that there doesn't really seem to be any one particular energy generation type that is more resilient than another. In, in my experience, in dozens and dozens of disaster areas, the biggest point of failure is in the transmission lines. So getting that electricity from one place to another that is uh, that is seems to be the most susceptible in an ice storm the lines come crashing down because they can't support the weight during a hurricane or a tornado the lines come down tree branches land on them things like that so it's more about trying to strengthen the resilience of the of the, the transportation system if you will rather than the generation system at least that has been my experience yeah we see so more and more I think a lot of communities nowadays, if I'm not mistaken, they put the, the wires underground in the new communities. So it's kind of interesting to see they probably had enough uh, enough wires coming down that they've uh, started to learn. But I suppose if you had an earthquake, wires underground wouldn't be that great either. So. Well, it depends on which part of the world you live in. If, it's, if you're living in California or Japan, where there's a lot of earthquake activity, then maybe that is not the most practical thing. Um, in Siberia, they can't put pipes underground because of the permafrost heaving and shifting. So they have to insulate them and put them above ground. So you always have to modify and customize for whatever your particular threat is. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, of course, burying these lines is a lot more expensive, but in, in the long run, maybe it pays off. So it's always going to be a compromise in one way or another. Right. And then the challenge of, of having an extreme weather event that's not supposed to be your particular threat. You know, I think that's the other piece is we, we often get ready for what we think is coming our way. And then something abnormal happens these days and we're not quite ready for it. So which I is what we saw that. in Texas, right? Exactly. These, Nobody these, these one in a hundred year storms are now becoming a one in five year storm. Yeah. We knew friends. Texas, Texas does floods. They're ready for it. <laughs> That, that was supposed to be their thing, but now they're also doing the, the ice thing. Sarah, how about you? Where would you go with this extreme weather uh, renewables conversation? Yeah, I mean, I think Chris really covered it with sort of the, all the spurious claims that have been uh, been made about it. Um, I mean, I think to me, one of the things is how do you, there's sort of two ways to make systems resilient. One is to do a really good job of, you know, kind of building out everything to a very high degree of, of strength. Um, and the other is to kind of make them simple, right? And so, you know, I think that things like weatherization and the ability to make homes that can be, uh, you know, remain warm and habitable for uh, quite a while without power, you know, a day or two days, um, is the kind of things that 
you know, it doesn't sound, it doesn't sound particularly cool and it's not a, um, a solar farm or something that somebody can cut a ribbon in front of, um, but it has multiple benefits in terms of, you know, the, the highest degree of resiliency. Um, and oh, by the way, along the way, you're also going to, you know, need less energy to power them um, and they're going to be more comfortable to live in as well too. So I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, there, there's a lot of pieces that, that go together, um, but I think oftentimes some of those um, more, you know, efficiency or static solutions, um, we're, we're quick to skip over those for, for other options. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and I should also point out that it's not just people who criticize renewables when something like this happens, right? Um, what happened in Texas was um, representatives from the oil and gas industry uh, got together, developed their talking points and made sure that those talking points were repeated by the governor and the other elected officials they own. Mm -hmm. Right. This was not just uh, some neutral, you know, generally accepted critique. Uh, this was a deliberate propaganda campaign orchestrated by the oil and gas industry to try to make hay and attack the renewables when, in fact, um, the wind power that went down was about 10% of the problem and the natural gas fired plants that went down was 40% of the problem. And that was the one part of the problem that the governor carefully avoided talking about. That was not an accident. Yeah, the big money in politics. We are definitely having a lot of challenges with that here as well. I know we're coming up on a municipal election in Alberta this fall. And I mean, it's obscene how much uh, folks can contribute <laughs> to their elected uh, officials. Uh, all legally, and it's very disconcerting when you when you look at what happens after extreme events and and who who takes the mic and what they say. Uh, so I appreciate you mentioning that. We're we're touching on adaptation, and I want to actually just jump right into that because um, I'm not sure what you folks have been experiencing in Toronto and and in the U.S., but you know we're we're dealing with most summers now in Edmonton and in Alberta are, you know, smoke filled, right? I mean, I attended a, a smoke session recently where I was told, uh, you know, basically Northern Alberta is going to be on fire for another hundred years. And then once the trees all die, the grass fire is just going to keep lighting up constantly because grass burns lots. So we're basically on fire and, um, we're dealing with smoke, uh, you know, you could have your arguments back and forth. Is this climate change? If not, if it is, not is it not? I, I mean, I've never dealt with this much smoke before, so I would argue it's probably linked, but uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, adaptation that's needed. And uh, George, you touched on much worse scenarios in other countries uh, where people are dealing with, uh, with the, literally like they're losing their land. Uh, the climate refugee issue. I guess if you look at that issue of adaptation in general, I'd be interested to hear uh, each of your perspectives on, you know, what is the most significant, if you could pick one or two pieces of the adaptation puzzle that you think we really need to focus in on as we, uh, as we promote renewables and do what we can to, uh, to turn this around. And as we look at sequestering, great. But uh, aside from that, what could we be doing as a society and, and worldwide to be more resilient and to adapt to the changes that are happening, whether we like them or not? Who wants to jump in on that adaptation question? <laughs> Sarah, you want to kick us off? Um, I mean, I think, you know, I would just come back to kind of what I had said before around uh, around some of the um, ways to, you know, make things sort of statically more uh, secure. Um, but I think it's also, you know, it's a question of, of looking at, again, you know, how do you do this within the political system and, and some of what happened within Texas, um, you know, what are the incentives for politicians to say, look, we need to spend more money to make our electricity system robust um, against the threat of climate if, you know, that money is going to show up on, uh, on, on the, their constituents' uh, electricity bills next month, and there's a bit of a roll of the dice of you know when in the next ten years is the storm coming. So um, I think there's some some serious questions that we need to ask about how do we kind of understand that we need to make some of these changes. Um, but I do you know I do hope that it is part of um, you know I think it would be a missed opportunity if we don't look at 
changes that need to be made through a lens of both adaptation um, and decarbonization, right? So rather than just trying to say, okay, well now, you know, these things are under threat, so let's figure out how to fix them. It's really, look, we're trying to solve, you know, these two problems and maybe there's a you know, few other ones actually in there as well. Um, when it, when it comes to housing around, you know, access to safe housing for, uh, for our communities. Um, and it's, you know, it's harder to solve more problems at once, but, but at the same time, um, you know, sometimes you can be clever and find the way that those pieces fit together. So I think that that's something that really um, needs to be an important part of this approach, because if we spend the next, you know, decade just throwing a ton of money at building bunkers, you know, we're, we're, we may be a little bit more uh, resilient, but it's going to cost a lot and it's not going to fix some of the other challenges. Yeah, that's a good point. I remember hearing a, a bunch of folks, you know, who are living on floodplains, you know, they want to just build up berms. Uh, but when you look at the cost of building the berms, as opposed to just buying them out of their houses and moving them off a floodplain, it's actually way cheaper to, to buy them out than to build all the berms. So I see your point about making sure what we're doing is most cost effective. Chris, where would you go with that question on adaptation? So there's there's sort of two parts to that in the way that I think about it. Uh, one is we we need to restore the ecosystems that uh, actually gave us protection from a lot of those problems in the past that we have destroyed, right? So uh, and and there are some really significant efforts underway to do that, right? So in the Gulf Coast, for example, especially after Katrina, um, there's now been some concerted efforts to restore the wetlands that do a, a fantastic job of absorbing storm surge and preventing you know, the excessive damage that, that we experienced in, in Katrina. Um, in the New York Harbor, uh, they're restoring the oyster beds uh, that also uh, dampen the waves. It's not gonna help you with the sea level rise with the, with the storm surge, but it helps you with the wave damage. Um, uh, restoring beaches that uh, you know, we've, we've now uh, either allowed to be destroyed or, or lost or been eroded or just built too close to, right? Um, the, the, the natural world has terrific ways of dealing with those problems if we would stop defeating them, right? Um, and so there's a lot of things that we can, like in the Chesapeake Bay, for example, they're uh, restoring uh, wetlands to um, that naturally existing Delmarva wetlands that do a fantastic job of absorbing things like storm surges. Um, in, in the West, uh, I mean, Colorado just experienced its worst wildfire year ever. Uh, the three largest wildfires in Colorado history happened a couple months ago. Um, I was here living in smoke for the three, three, three straight months uh, and almost couldn't leave the house. Uh, it was absolutely horrific. And a year before, actually, I did a, an episode with an expert named Michael Wera in, in California uh, talking about the wildfire problems that California has been experiencing. I used to live in California, um, so I know it well. And uh, one of the key outcomes of the conversation that I had with him about that was that we need to stop building so close to the wildland interface. Um, that's where a lot of the property damage and the human uh, life risk uh, is coming from. Uh, if we weren't building in the middle of the damn forest, we wouldn't be having so much property damage from forest fires, right? So um, there's things that we can do in terms of our own policies, where we build and our own activities, but also we just need to restore the, the natural ecosystem services that um, are, are provided by nature uh, if we would stop uh, destroying them. Yeah, I appreciate that. We have a tendency in Alberta to sprawl into our wetlands. We seem to love to just, <laughs> just grow right out there into that good farmland and all the wetlands. And, uh, and there's nothing stopping us. We don't have any mountains directly around us. So there's no, no barriers like a, a city like Vancouver has. So we are perpetually sprawling into our, our natural uh, protective barriers. And I think, uh, you, you know, what I hear you saying is almost we have to create a, a no man's land, really, <laughs> between us and a lot of these forests. Uh, absolutely. We saw that with Fort McMurray, the fire. I mean, it was horrific here in Alberta, where, you know, the homes that were, were so embedded within the forest, uh, you know, it's a beautiful place to live, gorgeous, but also why are we so close to all the forest. So it's a good question. Uh, we have to ask ourselves all the time here as well. George, where would you go with that adaptation question? Uh, interesting you mentioned Fort McMurray. Uh, I was 
one of the first people in the city of Fort McMurray after the fire and the ground was still so hot that it melted the bottom of my boots. Uh, it was so intense. And uh, it really shows just to, to, to build upon what Chris said, um, these natural phenomena aren't inherently natural disasters. They only become natural disasters when they negatively affect us. So in reality, we are the X factor in terms of what becomes a disaster and uh, being more in harmony with our surroundings would certainly go a long way to help saving a lot of money. Mm -hmm. We're coming up on uh, 830 here. So I'm going to ask one last question. And I think uh, it, it, and then I'll wrap things up. But uh, folks are asking here, can you folks speak more to the economic opportunities you see for Canada and especially Alberta if we move to a more leading role in the energy transition? Uh, in particular, people are wondering about manufacturing, if there's opportunities for that. Uh, and there are you know, just a lot of questions around um, you know, how we could become a leader and, and what are the opportunities there for us. And uh, maybe we'll just uh, end with that question tonight and then I'll uh, do some closing remarks. Sarah, would you like to kick us off as the one sitting in Alberta right now? <laughs> sure. So I think, um, you know, there's a few different things that I see. You know, we certainly have an opportunity to develop out our natural uh, renewable resources, you know, especially wind, solar, geothermal, um, and to, to benefit from the low cost power that that can bring. Um, I think that when we think about manufacturing and, and what resources we have within the province, certainly also looking at what are those, um, what are the metals and minerals that are going to continue to be demanded um, to build electric vehicles and solar panels and others going forward. Um, and there are definitely companies, you know, thinking about this, about how we can um, produce lithium uh, from, from the brines that exist in Alberta. Um, and so doing that in a way, you know, that is environmental environmentally responsible um, and that links into to manufacturing of the batteries. I think there's a real opportunity there um, for Alberta to, to kind of be powering another part of the transportation system going forwards. Thank you for that, Sarah. George, where would you uh, say we're best positioned from an economic perspective uh, to take advantage of this transition we're going through? Well, I mean, I, I mean, I kind of have to defer to the experts on that. It's not really my my field. Uh, however, I will say that uh, in all of my experience in Alberta, I've spent a tremendous amount of time in Alberta. I've always been impressed with the resilience and ingenuity of the people who have lived there, and and Albertans have been able to seize the resources that have been there and and use them. And I just uh, fully believe that they will be able to continue doing that in the future in a more sustainable way, just given the nature of, of the people that they are. Yeah, I had another presenter the other day say Albertans like to make deals so they can make deals in this sector too. Why not? <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, speaking to the character attributes, that's a good thing to capitalize on. How about you, Chris? Where would you say we should head for a, a better economic future and outlook? I, I don't feel particularly well, you know, super knowledgeable about uh, Alberta such that I could really give an expert answer on that. But I, just from what I'm aware of, uh, well, for one thing, you, you do have some mountains in Alberta, uh, pretty significant ones um, that can be a pumped hydro resource. Uh, you have you have plains uh, that can be a, that's a wind resource and it can also be a solar resource. Um, you have mines. Uh, there's there's some really interesting new technologies coming around where you're basically repurposing old mines uh, as storage systems uh, for grid scale storage. Um, and that can be compressed air. It can be various kinds of, um, you know, closed circulation uh, compression systems and, and so on. Um, uh, there's there's even potentially some um, some solar plays uh, involved with mines. Uh, any mining facility that's no longer being used but has a grid connection or a coal plant that's shut down that has a grid connection, those grid connections are incredibly valuable and, and should be um, repurposed uh, if possible. If you can hook them up to some local renewable resources and uh, start shipping clean electrons down them instead, uh, that's, that's a great way to go. But beyond that, I don't know that I can speak too much to 
Alberta's specific um, opportunities. Oh, I appreciate that. I mean, we, we do have some incredible geography, we have some incredible geology, and we need to think about that and how it can be used to, uh, to help uh, address the climate crisis and, and, and really propel our economy forward. I want to thank you all. I think I could grill the three of you all day long. So I appreciate you taking so much time with us tonight. I get to ask you more questions on Saturday. So I, I feel like anyone who didn't have their questions asked to answer tonight can come online on Saturday and have an opportunity to ask uh, their questions again, and we'll have more time then. So I want to thank you all very much for attending, encourage you to join us for the rest of our solar show content. It's uh, running tomorrow, Friday, as well as Saturday. Any important announcements throughout this event will be posted in the lobby of our conferencing software for you to review. Also, please don't forget to check out the networking opportunities throughout our conference platform and the exhibitor booths in our trade show. The exhibitor booths will be live. They will not be live and staffed until Saturday. However, you can go in there anytime to learn about the many interesting organizations that are there and you can leave comments and questions for them to respond to on Saturday. Now we wish to once again, thank our three presenters for this wonderful session. We're gonna do a, a, a turn things off in a few minutes here, but uh, we're gonna see them all again on Saturday. And uh, please, when you come uh, tomorrow morning uh, to join us, uh, make sure you, um, you take time with the Q&A to, to really take advantage of these incredible presenters we have. So thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening and, uh, and a good rest, a well-deserved rest after a lot of grilling. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Good night, all. I was clapping. <laughs>